Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine our show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Jackie A., Mike P., and Jared W. New guest on the program today, Leif Nilsson has joined us. Leif is the CEO of Surge Copper, an exploration and early stage project development company with projects in British Columbia. Surge is listed on the Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol SURG and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol SRGXF. Leif, thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me. It's great to be on, Andrew. Well, how about a quick one to two minute overview of Surge Copper for the audience? Yeah, sure. So uh, the company's, um, I think, simple in the sense that we uh, we're focused entirely in one area of, of British Columbia. So, so BC is obviously the the main copper producing region in Canada. There's there's a handful of um, operating mines there. Uh, we are located in a, I would say, a pretty special area. We um, surround a district that has a mine and mill there that's currently on care and maintenance. It's called the uh, the Huckleberry Mine. Uh, that asset is owned by a, a separate company called uh, Imperial Metals, and and Surge has been active in this region for uh, quite a number of years. And going back about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, discovered a um, a fairly large porphyry system uh, in in pretty close proximity to Huckleberry, so about uh, six kilometers to the to the south of that uh, mine and mill. Uh, the company, you know, in in recent years, like like many other companies, has been um, when, when copper prices were were down and there wasn't a lot of uh, excitement or activity in that sector of the of the mining business, uh, you know, was was in sort of a cash cash conservation and uh, hibernation type mode. Uh, but myself and a, a new group of people got involved at the company um, uh, going back uh, about a year and a half now, recapitalized the business and uh, have been very aggressively pursuing uh, growth and consolidation in this uh, this overall district. So we've done a handful of deals to stitch together a, a pretty big land package that now surrounds uh, most of um, Huckleberry. There's a few known deposits there that we've, um, we're have we earning into and have gained you know, ownership uh, interest over. Uh, but another big kind of aspect of what we're doing is that this district has had, you know, for, for a variety of reasons that you see often in the mining business, you know, in terms of lack of funding, just sort of the wrong time in the cycle, fractured ownership, et cetera. It, it really hasn't been um, systematically and, and aggressively explored, and there's you know great evidence and great uh, indications of, of prospectivity there, and, and we control now the majority of this district, so uh, we're going after that in a, in a pretty systematic manner, um, uh, exploring uh, areas around known deposits as well as doing more more generative uh, grassroots exploration in uh, prospective areas ar around this district. The Huckleberry Mine itself, as I said, owned by a third party. That company's got lots of other stuff going on in their business. Don't really know exactly where things are, are headed from their perspective in terms of restarting that asset. They've talked about restarting uh, some of their other, one of their other assets that's currently on care maintenance as well. So we can talk about that uh, as we get into the discussion. But I think the, the key thing for investors to know here is big porphyry district uh, in British Columbia, Lots of infrastructure in place, uh, partly because of, of Huckleberry, but also just where we are in the province, uh, and big exploration upside. And we're, we're we're going after kind of each each uh, aspects of that value equation to to advance things and, and surface value where we can. Leaf, I appreciate that overview. How about uh, your background and experience in the natural resource sector? Well, personally, um, going back to my uh, university days, I, I have a background and degree in. Um, in physics and and uh, specialized in exploration geophysics, so you know imaging systems um, uh, that you that you use in in mining as well as uh, oil and gas. Uh, I did did that at the uh, University of Toronto here in Canada. Um, worked as a you know researcher and and um, uh, analyst in that space for uh, a few years before making a, a pretty formal transition, I would say to um, to corporate finance. So I, I joined uh, one of the big Canadian bank owned dealers uh, relatively early in my career uh, and, and spent from that point forward, um, you know, about a, a dozen, 13 years, something like that, uh, working for a handful of 
uh, international banks. So, so here in Canada, but also spent some time uh, in the, the, the London market. Uh, and most recently was um, uh, back here in Canada with a, uh, a pretty well-known uh, Australian uh, global financial institution uh, doing, doing uh, M&A advisory and capital market stuff in mining. So um, whole career in mining, um, lots of that in a you know very capital markets facing capacity doing um, you know transactions and helping helping mining companies to to raise capital and um, affect growth transactions. How about the uh, capital structure at Surge? Just cover the shares outstanding at this point. Uh, a breakdown of major shareholders and cash on hand. Sure. So the cap structure, um, it's all equity. There's there's some options and warrants there, but uh, there's no debt in the company, so it's uh, it's simple from from that perspective. The shares outstanding today uh, about 165 million, uh, and then in terms of options and warrants, there's uh, about 70 million in addition to that. Uh, the the majority of those options and warrants, probably around um, you know 50 or so, are are in the money. Um, uh, quite quite deeply so in in some cases and and then there's been some option grants to a, a lot of the incoming management and, and directors over the last year there's there's been a pretty thorough refresh of the the board and management over the last year which we can we could touch on but um, a bunch of those options and warrants were um, uh, were, were sorry options were set uh, over the course of, of the year um, and then in terms of the cash balance today it's uh, it's just under under 10 million dollars and there's a mix of what we call hard dollars and flow through dollars here in Canada. So uh, back in June of this year, we closed a uh, $14 million uh, placement uh, that was a, a mix of flow through and hard dollars. And so the uh, a big component of our cash balance today is um, uh, is flow through dollars, which are invested or allocated uh, in, a, in a certain manner for qualifying exploration expenditures uh, at our projects here in Canada. And just the major shareholders, what you can mention on that. I would sort of rate it as a fairly closely held company in terms of uh, insiders and and close associates. So the uh, the management and board uh, probably owns about 15% today. There's actually been uh, quite aggressive accumulation going on uh, uh, between the management and board uh, over the course of the, of the whole year, but uh, even in recent weeks in particular. Uh, and that would extend to close associates, so you know family, uh, business partners, that sort of thing of um, a bunch of the people involved directly with the company. Prior to my involvement in the company, um, it was a, you know, for many years, a, a very retail-owned uh, stock uh, between, I would say, uh, high net worth and, and retail investors in the, the Prince George community in, in central BC, as well as uh, Vancouver. We continue to receive a lot of support from uh, those historical investors, but um, as I mentioned, we did a bought deal earlier this year, so that was you know, largely the, the first institutional uh, round that the company's done. Uh, so we're kind of in the early stages of growing the institutional uh, ownership component of the business. Um, the only sort of component pieces of that that um, are, are publicly disc disclosable is uh, Altius was a lead investor in, in, um, in that financing. So they own uh, not a huge percentage, but uh, a, a few percent of the company. And then uh, by way of one of the property acquisitions that we did uh, uh, late last year for the Berg property, the, the vendor there was uh, Sentara Gold, so they're a four to five percent shareholder in the company as well. How about the the management and board ownership? Leaf, what would you say they own the shares at uh, in terms of price as compared to the current price levels? So the company, uh, well, I mean, a lot of these folks have been around for um, uh, a number of years. So Pat Glazier, who's our our largest. Uh, shareholder de facto. Um, I don't know what his cost base is, but um, he, he would be certainly well in the money in terms of where his cost basis is. Um, uh, some of the new folks involved in the company, so, so maybe I'll just pause and, and touch on that. So going back about a year, two gentlemen by the names of Craig Perry and Christian cargill Samard uh, were really responsible for sort of restarting things at Surge. So made an approach to the company, uh, and, and part of that was this recapitalization, private placement, uh, they joined the board um, as part of that transaction and initiated a process to attract uh, new management. I came across from my prior role as a as a banker to take on that that position in January of 2021, and subsequently, as we moved through the year, there was um, two additional directors that came on as as part of a you know continuing renewal of the board. So you know I, I would say all those people that have kind of joined over the last 12 months or so would have a cost basis um, at or or um, even above where where current share prices are. Whereas 
uh, the folks that were involved with the company historically, as well as at the time of that uh, recapitalization financing last fall, which was done uh, at 15 cents. Uh, so they would have a, you know, on average, a lower cost basis compared to where we are today. How about on the cash? You know, you guys got just under 10 million there. Do you see that that cash gets you guys through 2022 if you had to? I mean, obviously you have uh, some expiration results that would be coming in, plus some of that money is going to expiration next year. But if you had to stretch that capital and you weren't looking to raise, could you make it last through 2022 or would you guys expect to still raise at some point in 2022? Yeah, that was the intention. So um, and I'll pause here. Just the, the reason I was making a point about the flow through is um, so, so flow through dollars, uh, the, the way they work here in, in Canada is whenever you raise them, you're obliged to uh, deploy that money um, within the subsequent calendar year. So we, we raised that money in, as I said, June of, of this year. And so we have a an obligation to um, uh, invest that money in, in, in the ground and qualifying exploration expenditures uh, by the end of, uh, of 2022. So that we, we don't really have a lot of flexibility to, you know, sit on that, so to speak, if um, if, if market conditions uh, didn't didn't move in our favor. But we pieced that financing together and kind of designed our treasury and, and budget to allow for the hard dollar component of our treasury, which is uh, around two million dollars, to you know provide us with sufficient bandwidth for. Uh, corporate GNA and kind of some of the, the, the non-exploration expenditures that we have going on to, to take us well through 2022. So um, that's sort of the, the runway that we're on. Um, as is normal in this business, you, you sort of anticipate that if you're if you're prosecuting your business and you're having good results and the market uh, conditions are are in your favor, um, you know you, you need to be opportunistic about um, uh, about you know reloading and, and sort of resetting your, your runway uh, in accordance with that. But we're certainly not at that uh, point today with um, with the, the treasury position I've, I've just outlined and you know, the, year, the year that we have ahead of us in terms of what we're planning to do. So um, the other the other kind of lever that we have or piece of the puzzle that I'll, I'll mention is the um, recapitalization placement that was done uh, last summer, last fall, the 15 cent unit. It had a 17 cent warrant uh, as part of that unit. So that's well in the money. Uh, that's that's something that um, I, I would say is held in, in large part by um, supportive shareholders of the company, lots of uh, lots of whom are insiders. So uh, that's another lever that we can pull in terms of um, uh, accelerating the exercise of some of those warrants to uh, to deliver additional hard dollars into the company, uh, and the sense of you know to give you a sense of the the scale there, it's um, it's upward of six million dollars in proceeds that could come out of that. Understood. How about uh, key people? You mentioned a few folks that came in. Selecting out Craig Perry is certainly a great guy to have in your corner. Any other folks that you want to mention that have been brought into the company that you'd like to highlight and their importance? Yeah, certainly. So, uh, so Christian, um, he was uh, instrumental in in um, kind of putting this this deal together, and particularly the uh, uh, the acquisition of, of Berg, and um, you know, very involved um, individual in the company. Uh, I think in recognition of that, at our AGM back in September, he was um, um, elevated or promoted, if you will, from uh, an independent director to a non-executive uh, chairman. So he's now uh, chair of the board. Uh, at, at the same uh, point in time, we, as I mentioned, recruited two new independent directors to replace two outgoing directors. Those two gentlemen uh, are Richard Coulterjohn and John Dorwood. They are, I think, well known in the marketplace, particularly here in uh, Toronto, where I'm based, um, in terms of their most recent role with uh, with Roxgold. So John was the CEO of Roxgold. Richard was a director. Uh, but both of them have, um, you know, lengthy and very successful careers in the business. Uh, Richard, who's um, you know one of the more senior members of our uh, our board, he uh, you know post his career in investment banking himself, he was uh, CEO of a, a junior copper company called Centenario. Uh, they they you know had a successful exit on that, and subsequent to that, his career has been you know a lot of these independent director roles where he's um, I would say a concentrated investor in the company and you know actively involved in. Um, in guiding management uh, from a um, you know an independent director perspective, but very very engaged guy. Um, as a former banker, he he and John were both people that I worked with uh, very closely over a number of years. So when we set about on this uh, 
mission to um, to renew the board. They were um, literally number one and two choices for us, and uh, we went about that um, that exercise, and we're we're very happy that uh, we attracted uh, both of them to the company. So the board, as it, as it sits today, is five new individuals. So the four I just mentioned, plus myself. Uh, and then three individuals from, um, uh, I guess, the board prior to everyone, all the new people getting involved. So that would be um, uh, Pat Glazier, uh, Jim Pettit, and uh, and Shane Ebert. And uh, Pat is a, as I said, he's the largest shareholder in the company. He runs a private uh, forestry business in central BC. You know, mining is a, a big part of what he does with his um, with his wealth. He's a, a big investor in a number of mining ventures and uh, been you know, hugely supportive of the company. Uh, during that that lull in market conditions and kind of keeping things uh, keeping things going and keeping the company uh, in good stead. Uh, Shane is another you know very important part of the team. He um, so he wore a number of hats during the um, kind of hiatus years. President, VP Exploration, CEO, Director, uh, kind of keeping everything running smoothly. But uh, perhaps more importantly, he's the he's the technical individual, the geologist that is. Uh, responsible for the the discoveries of the the seal deposits, so he's got more than a decade of continuity with these projects, and is very sort of important in terms of uh, guiding the, the technical direction of the of the, co- of the company and, and our programs there. PhD geologist, um, you know, spent most of his his career in uh, in porphyry environments, including the uh, the discovery of a, a big porphyry deposit in uh, in Mexico called uh, Bajarachi. Um, I'd probably you know. The only other thing to talk about there is um, uh, over the course of the year in terms of attracting new people to the company as well, uh, a couple other technical advisors have been um, you know, pretty actively involved in the company. Uh, one named Paul Chowron, who uh, most recently was the chief operating officer of, uh, of Taranga up until their, their sale to uh, Endeavor. Uh, and he's an individual that's been involved in lots of big project uh, builds, uh, Dieter Gold being one of them. Uh, and then, of course, the, the sort of latter part of the history of, of Taranga involved the acquisition of uh, the Masawa project from Rangold slash Barrick. Pretty complex transaction. Um, Taranga had a had the only piece of infrastructure there in uh, in Senegal with the um, the mill there, and Masawa was a uh, I wouldn't quite call it a stranded asset, but it was a resource that was proximal to that mill and. I think untangling the different synergies that uh, existed between the, uh, the the mill infrastructure and that uh, resource was uh, a pretty pretty complex transaction, and Paul was a, a big big part of the the technical aspects of uh, figuring that out. Uh, and then Steve Blower would be the other one. So Steve is a um, exploration geologist that worked very closely with Craig uh, over a number of years, um, including most recently at uh, ISO Energy. So lots of experience in the Athabasca Basin and in uranium environments, but uh, but actually did start his career as a uh, geologist at um, at Huckleberry of all places. So lots of you know germane experience and, and knowledge about uh, the district that we're operating in. How about the first project here, Leaf? Let's get into that. Let's let's chat on some of the project uh, items here. Utsa project, if I didn't butcher that uh, too bad. Copper, no, gold, right. molybdenum. Talk about these recent results coming out, upcoming news on this project. I understand there's more exploration results coming out. What do you expect to accomplish next year as well? Yeah, so maybe I'll I'll frame it in terms of where these uh, where the project was before um, we we sort of refinanced the company and embarked on what was a very busy year in 2021, where we are today and and where we're taking things next year because we're at a pretty interesting um, kind of middle point or, or, or watershed moment. So. Uh, and I'll I'll sort of use rough numbers in in telling the story. So uh, if you sort of rewind about a year uh, ago, the the, the project that it's a, it, it comprises um, three porphyry deposits, which are referred to as West Seal, East Seal, and Ox. Uh, the the two seal deposits are you know there's more or less continuous mineralization in that in that system from a from a mining perspective historically they've looked at looked at it in you know with with discrete pits uh, around uh, both both deposits but we're we're trying to take a fresh look at it and uh, for argument's sake it's sort of one one system so the seal deposit and then the ox deposit are are distinct uh, things and the the total uh, drill hole database so the amount of uh, you know previous drilling investment that has gone into um, the the resource if you will at uh, the Utsa uh, project is Roughly speaking, around 100,000 meters. And in the case of the East Seal deposit and the Ox deposits, these are both smaller uh, com- 
components of the overall resource inventory at UTSA, which today sits at about 224 million tonnes. Uh, and then the West Seal deposit is uh, today the, the biggest component of that. So out of that 224 million tonnes, uh, it's about uh, two thirds of, of that, uh, that overall tonnage. Uh, and so where the nuance sits in all this is that the, the West Seal deposit, it's um, all these things you, you ultimately need to or, or want to have uh, pick constraints put around them in terms of capturing uh, the, the sort of relevant resource. None of these things, none of these deposits at this point in time have have really, uh, you know, shown any attributes of having real meaningful underground uh, potential. So the, the grades can get, you know, really high in areas and, and pretty exciting, but uh, but not quite, you know, leaping past that threshold of where it would clearly be bulk underground mineable. So so all these are very, I would say, uh, vanilla open pit um, targets. And in the case of West Seal. You know the geometry of the deposit is 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 part of the um, the opportunity and the the sort of you know the mystery of uh, what we're what we're trying to get after and what I mean by what I mean by that is there is a non pit constrained resource done a couple years prior to the more, most recent one that is much much larger it's around uh, almost half a billion tons uh, and so what we're trying to do with a lot of the drilling this year it's really focused on West Seal and it's really focused on optimizing a, a, a more modern pit constrained resource and, and what I mean by that is metal prices have moved um, the the other kind of input parameters that go into a, a whittle constraining pit have evolved from where they were in 2016 and strategically I think the you know the marketplace today is uh, perhaps more more interested in or, or more accepting of um, you know large large tonnage you know big open pit projects than uh, than the market may have been uh, a few years ago, where the, the emphasis was on smaller kind of lower capital startup type things. So what we're trying to capture with the drilling at West Seal today is really repositioning it as, um, you know, what, what is the, the true open pit mineable size of this uh, of this deposit? And so the way we attacked the drilling program this year was to start things out with a, you know, a sense of what the true volumetric playground that we're working with is. So we stuck a big uh, conceptual uh, pit shape around uh, the, the, the entire seal deposit and said this is what we're working with. This is where um, you know drill density has been lacking in the past and, and and frankly at West Seal it was it really was not a drilled off deposit. There was lots of areas that were you know open in multiple directions um, both laterally and at depth uh, and and so there was aspects of the you know 30,000 meters of, of resource drilling that went into West Seal this year that were you know genuine step outs in uh, specific you know, volumetric spaces that we wanted to fill in, as well as uh, infill drilling where drill density was lower and, you know, looking looking through the old block model, there was, you know, good indications that uh, the high grade was going to be, you could extend it within the block model. So kind of internal uh, optimization drilling, if you will. So uh, 30,000 meters of that over the last year, we've now, you know, cut off that drill hole database and are in the uh, pretty advanced stages of, of working on a, a resource update at uh, at West Seal, so can't give you any any numbers on that, but uh, that was the strategic uh, initiative that that took place over the last year was uh, really finish the task of drilling off West Seal, uh, take a fresh look at a, a pit constrained resource there, and kind of you know re reset um, the bar there. In addition to that, there was some exploration drilling. Uh, We'll, we'll circle back and talk about the the regional exploration opportunity, but to give you a flavor, we were uh, very busy this year. Obviously, very focused on the the West Seal deposit area in particular, and of course, access and efficiency is a is a big part of you know how you're how you're sort of allocating uh, efforts when it comes to exploration. So we've got lots of targets all around the district and lots of you know interesting things to get after but in the context of what was a very busy summer the manner in which we were prioritizing things was you know what targets do we have in the near resource area at Utsa that have you know multiple overlapping data sets in terms of geophysics soils uh, etc good sort of uh, conviction and, and confidence on targeting but also access. So um, access in this area is uh, in large part determined by uh, uh, forest service roads, and and there are a lot of them in our area. There's there's uh, sort of lots of crisscrossing forest roads uh, all through this area, and so we had uh, you know quite to our benefit a lot of a lot of areas 
within the um, IP geophysical trends uh, around the aux deposit and the seal deposits that uh, gave us quite a lot of targets to, to test. And so again, round numbers, there was about a little bit more than 15,000 meters that has gone into that, uh, that type of drilling over the last year. Uh, come, you know, early on, or, or I suppose um, it was late in the summer, but early on in the, in the uh, exploration drilling, we were, uh, we were targeting a, a deep chargeability anomaly uh, north of the, uh, the seal deposits. And you know, quite high in that drill hole, we, um, we intersected breccia style mineralization in uh, a pretty large step out from a known breccia zone. And so uh, given the fact that this breccia style mineralization is higher grade, we intersected it close to surface and it's close to existing resources. Uh, those are all the sort of boxes that you want to tick for an exploration target, the kind of thing that can, you know, ultimately lead to a, you know, higher grade payback zone. So we, we really focused our efforts there in the latter part of the summer. Uh, lots of individual uh, holes over, over shorter meterage because of the nature of the style of mineralization. It's a narrower zone. So sort of a multitude of roughly 100 meter holes that we put in, into this breccia zone. We've only started to release the results of that. So we put our first batch of results out from that breccia zone a little more than a week ago, 11 holes out of a total 45 holes into the zone. Great results so far. Um, we've, we've basically shown pretty good continuity on this zone over about 200 meters. And that's again, additive or in addition to a, a known zone that has a historical resource of about a million tons. So we'll see where we get to. The goal there is, uh, you know, sort of three to five million tons of, of grades that are a multiple of porphyry grades. So if it was on the high end of that, it would be a, a home run. If it was on the low end, we'd be, we'd be very happy and it can have um, significant sort of uh, value impact on a, on a project like this. So the highlighted intervals were, you know, in the range of 25 to 45 meters at, uh, you know, one and a half percent copper equivalent, um, again, rough numbers. And, and there was some lower grade uh, hits as well. So the nature of breccia mineralization, you'll have, um, there's more sort of volatility in that, uh, in, in that grade, but we, we do expect to see uh, lots more kind of high grade pockets within there and averaging out uh, into something that looks, uh, looks pretty good. Good info and gives the audience a little bit of a gauge on what you guys are expecting to bring out here and people can get an idea, get their head around this project and then the proximity of some of these other projects. On the economic studies, anything planned in 2022 to start looking at for an update there, or do you see that that's maybe 2023 at this point based on how things go? Yeah, I mean, we're, we have not put a, any sort of guidance to the market in terms of that, but what I you know, always say is there's, uh, there's a lot of work going on in the background that would ultimately form, uh, you know, the, the component pieces to a, an economic study. And um, and a lot of this stuff is we, we need to we need to de determine what we're gonna how, how we're gonna think about um, you know the configuration of a number of these different deposits. So so you made you made a reference to the 2016 study. So I'll just uh, for your listeners give a quick explanation of of the nuance around that. So uh, it was a I think a really unique and interesting study that um, you know very explicitly addressed the potential synergy value that uh, you know may exist between some of our deposits and uh, and, and the Huckleberry Mill uh, but there's some real significant caveats uh, or, or kind of asterisks around that and, and really it relates to some of the assumptions that went into that study around uh, overall kind of capacity for, for tailings storage and other things so Huckleberry as a as an operation today um, when it was put on care and maintenance in 2016, it had a reserve life that was going to take it to 2021, so call it about five years. When that when that you know reserve life is is complete, uh, there is a, a a pit there that would have been mined out, and that pit is something that is uh, historically has been used for uh, tailings and, and waste rock um, uh, storage, and so is is effectively permitted for that use. Uh, and so this this PEA that Surge did was on the basis of you know at the end of the Huckleberry reserve life, um, you know is there an opportunity to mine uh, some portion of the mineralized material at, at some of these deposits at Utsa, uh, have that have that that mineralized material processed at the Huckleberry Mill, 
with tailings stored at the infrastructure that uh, exists there. And the concept is, you know, low capital restart, focusing on using existing infrastructure, existing permits, and extending the useful life of that uh, that infrastructure. So, you know, really, um, again, it's PEA, so a lot of it has, you know, big error bars on everything, but the order of magnitude capital is is a huge differentiating feature of it compared to, you know, virtually any greenfields development uh, of a big, uh, big, you know, porphyry uh, copper mining um, uh, opportunity. But um, yeah, the you know the big takeaway there is it's only a very small subset of the resource inventory at UTSA that was modeled into that PEA because of some of those constraints. So what are the numbers? Well, again, the the resource inventory at the time, which is still in effect today, about 224 million tons. And the amount that was modeled into that production scenario was only 65 million tons. So big sort of delta there. And there's good reasons for that. But from where we sit today as a company that we're trying to surface value on, on all of the assets that we own, there's a big question about those those resources that didn't go into that PEA. Like, what are those worth? What do you, what do, you do with them? And in terms of physically what's going on, the deposits that were... Um, that were modeled in that PEA, the majority of it was quite explicitly the East Seal deposit and the Ox deposit, and there was a very small um, amount modeled coming out of West Seal, like 10 to 15 million tons. And so I, I think it's fair to say that the West Seal deposit has never had economic analysis performed on it. There's really no kind of benchmark out there or, or number out there for uh, what this deposit could be. Hence our focus on, you know, let's finish the task of drilling this out, kind of optimizing things to to put ourselves in a position to to look at that. Um, the other, you know, the other component pieces that go into project studies, uh, of course, are things like metallurgical test work, um, you know, scoping level analysis on some of the infrastructure components that um, that you need to to build the project. And in the case of that 2016 PEA, that was what was so unique about it is it, it explicitly relied upon some of the existing infrastructure around this district because of Huckleberry. So uh, when I say there's stuff going on right now in terms of the component pieces of it, it's, it's a lot of that stuff to, to sort of understand, you know, when we do put a pin in this is the project concept of, of what, you know, standalone West Seal would look like. We, we need to know what the options are and what some of the, the trade-offs are. So we're, we're actively working on a number of those things. When we know what some of those decision points uh, ultimately look like, I think crystallizing that into a preliminary economic analysis type study is, is not a large undertaking in terms of additional time or um, cost to us. So it's, it's just a matter of getting the component pieces in place. So can't tell... Um, I can't tell investors today that it's something that we are, um, you know, targeting for X quarter next year, but it, it is something that during the course of 2022, we should you know, know a lot more about in terms of what direction we're heading. Okay. How would this fit in here with the proximity of these projects? And given the status of the Huckleberry mine, not much left in it as it stands today anyway, would it make sense to potentially buy this mine, do some type of an earn in on that project from Imperial to support the surge projects? I mean, how does that fit in? I mean, it, it sounds like it would be of interest. Yeah, it's, it may. And it's I think it's... um it's a little bit one has to be careful sort of you know putting a pin in these things when a lot of the work that we're doing is to better understand and put real engineering rigor behind knowing what we own and and how that sort of compares against some of those alternatives so surge did a good job in 2016 i think of putting um some real detail behind the the scope of of that combination and and those those synergies of course the world changed at that time in the sense that the the Huckleberry mine was put on care and maintenance and, you know, Surge also really stopped a lot of its work because of the, the market conditions. So really this whole district has been in a way frozen in time for a number of years. And so where we sit today and, you know, how we're going to look at uh, those those different uh, comparisons, we, we are not at all intending to rehash or, or update that, uh, that 2016 uh, PEA. We are, you know, contemplating, you know, what, how do we better understand uh, what a standalone project concept or, or, you know, opportunity looks like. You know, there's there's significant overlap in the Venn diagrams between these two things. And the reason for that is because the infrastructure at Huckleberry, as I alluded to before, it isn't large enough from a tailings storage capacity as well as throughput capacity perspective to, you know, serve as the 
keystone piece of infrastructure uh, here in this district forever. So even if there was some realization of the concept that was outlined in that 2016 PEA, you would eventually get to some point where you know there's that you know, huge resource at West Seal that isn't isn't sort of part of that. And and um, I think the the task at hand here for us is to understand what the total resource opportunity is in this district and then you know start to put some real numbers and thinking behind um, how to how to open that up how to how to really um, come up with the you know project design components that are going to um, you know allow you to you know design something and make something that is uh, uh, you know bigger and lasts a lot longer than uh, the existing infrastructure in place so that, that may sound like a roundabout answer and I'm not directly answering your question about you know are we interested in in buying that that um, that piece of infrastructure it's i think it's premature to say and and uh, you know probably not the uh uh the right place to to make a specific comment on it but um whenever you have these situations with infrastructure in place that's not being not being used lots of resources around it there's there's a lot of you know value to be created um but the component pieces of how how that all gets stitched together is um, you can do you can do lots of stuff on a whiteboard but uh you got to get the the real answers in place and that takes um uh, it takes time and, and effort to do that, and that's uh, that's a lot of uh, what we're working on. So, will will we be interested in you know pursuing further consolidation in the future? Um, time will tell. Yeah, it's good to know, and, and there's there's going to be a lot of upgrades and expansion and so forth done if that was the case. But let's move on to Berg for a moment. Leaf Copper here at Molybdium. Uh, just talk about the earning agreement with Centera to reach that 70% ownership level and where that stands today as far as where, when it started, et cetera. Sure. So the the agreement's about a year old, um, and it had really two components to it. One was a um, upfront payment component, and the other is a work component. So on the upfront upfront payment component, on signing about a year ago, uh, we just had the anniversary this week. Actually, uh, there was a four million dollar payment made in surge shares. So that's how Centera came to own the the position that they own in the company today. Uh, subsequent to that on the anniversary for the next four years, we have to make a combined uh, payment to them of a million dollars. So the total is five million. We did four up front. We just we just did another issuance of about two hundred thousand dollars worth of surge stock, and we'll have to do uh, four more of those over the course of the next uh, four years. The work component is uh, eight million dollars over five years, and we have so far completed uh, about one. 1.2, 1.3 million of that uh, over the last year, and that was a combination of you know, road upgrade work, geophysics, and and drilling. And we can we can get into the details of all that. But um, uh, so we're you know in in a, in a good position, sort of moving through that option agreement uh, prudently, and and exactly where we should be for uh, where we are at year one out of a five year uh, earning uh, and. That is a 70% earn-in, so when all of those expenditures and um, and payments are completed, you know the option will be deemed to have been exercised, and a 70-30 joint venture would uh, would be struck at that time. The option agreement itself has uh, some you know a skeleton framework for what that JV shareholders agreement uh, will look like, uh, and some other I guess important pieces of it are. Uh, we have the um, we have the right to accelerate uh, you know all of that at any point in time. So um, if if we decided to for whatever reason, if it was a transaction situation or otherwise, that that whole uh, option agreement can be collapsed um, you know immediately through some you know cash payments or or otherwise. So it's 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 entirely at our option to control the the rate at which all that uh, all that happens. But yeah, from where we sit today. Got four years until um, until that uh, that comes to an end. And how about the the focus on this project? What's up next? What can we expect in 2022 on this project? For, for your listeners, it's it's in the same uh, district. It's uh, it's further from Huckleberry, but it's a much bigger deposit. So I, I think it's less clear today, uh, you know, how or in what manner this this deposit um, you know could be tied into what we're doing in the in the overall uh, Utsa area. Uh, because it's a bit further, but also because it's it's higher elevation. So in our present in our presentation material, there's um, there's good sort of photos of what what both project areas look like, and I think that's an important distinction because 
you know, this whole Huckleberry area, it sits in the kind of foothills of the coastal range mountains. So you're right on the cusp where to the east, it's the central plateau. It's, you know, flat lying to the horizon and to the west, the, you know, topography starts getting more rugged. Uh, the Berg project itself is in, you know, one of those, one of those uh, front ranges. So it sits up in the mountains. It's in a sort of a saddle shaped bowl depression in, um, in one of these valleys up there. Huge deposit. So there's a pit constrained resource around it already of uh, right now about 610 million tons in that kind of, you know, low to mid 0.4% copper equivalent range. Um, and yeah, the historical, I, I think, uh, investment there is a lot of drilling, about 55,000 meters of drilling from uh, predominantly placer dome and terrain metals. Uh, both of those groups also did extensive uh, metallurgical test work programs. So it's got attributes to it that are uh, pretty advanced in terms of figuring out, you know, is this a standalone project or is it something that can be um, meaningfully connected into what we're doing elsewhere in the district? Uh, that's that's sort of what we're um, spending some time thinking about. We're, we're not we're not the first ones to do that. So um, some of those prior operators I mentioned have have done some internal scoping uh, analysis on some of that. So there's there's been you know a few attempts to look at these things and and some good indicative results from that that we're we're looking to to refresh. But um, again, scale is important here, right? Like 600 million ton resource compared to the scale of a mill that sits at Huckleberry, like there's a big mismatch there. So uh, you wouldn't really you wouldn't really want to or be able to connect these things together unless there's a concept for a, you know, a big runway to, to expand throughput at, at a mill or look at, you know, a much larger mill concept that you're building from scratch. And from that perspective, yeah, there's a, this is something that happens all the time in mining and exploration districts where exploration results, discoveries can can start to sort of shift the center of gravity around a, a district. And I think that option is um, discounted in the overall Huckleberry district. So the Berg deposit is very big. There's a lot of interesting exploration targets uh, in that northern part of the district as well that um, we intend to, to put some focus on. So, you know, a single season of drilling or, or a single drill hole that makes an interesting discovery can really um, move the needle in terms of what you're trying to, to do from a, a project design concept. So we don't want to get ahead of ourselves on any of those decisions before we, um, you know, make some headway on, on some of the regional exploration opportunities that we see. But um, what we have done in this first year of operatorship of, of the Berg property is uh, predominantly reestablishing access and then, you know, build, rebuilding a camp and a, a small drill program. And so that all took place specifically at the Berg deposit area. Uh, but there's, you know, the Berg property is a much bigger piece of the, of the, the chessboard. And there's lots of different um, target areas there that uh, we, we were not able to, you know, we, we didn't really put any, um, didn't have any sort of uh, capacity to deal with during 2021, but have moved to the fore in terms of focus for 2022. And top of that list is a, uh, is an exploration target uh, in the, in the sort of northern part of that district, uh, affably named Burgett, uh, not the Berg deposit. This is a, uh, a target immediately to the east of that really exciting exploration target. We can go into the details of it if, uh, if you wish, but it's, um, it's, it's one of these things that has multiple overlapping reasons why it, um, it, it looks like an exciting exploration target. Previous owners uh, have, have drilled in some areas, but from first principles, when you, when you look at the totality of, of information, um, the areas that are probably most interesting to, to be testing um, have been underexplored. Uh, we've we've been collecting new geophysical data, um, you know, here and elsewhere, and so uh, it's something that we think holds a lot of promise for potentially a, a significant dis discovery. So that's another overall part of the Berg uh, property that will uh, capture a lot of our attention in um, in 2022. What's your position as far as how these projects might work together? Maybe they don't. Maybe they work on a standalone basis. What do you guys see as your expectation for a production profile? mine life, you know, what's your overall threshold that you think attracts suitors to the surge story, to the surge projects? What would you guys expect would attract attention in terms of profile, life, et cetera, on a potential project? You hear plenty of kind of round numbers bandied about for, for these things. So uh, let's start at kind of the resource side of things. So 
I, I think a district with a, a billion tons and whether that's in one deposit or, or multiple is, uh, is sort of debatable, but I, I think that's kind of the, um, an important threshold in terms of is, is this a real district that uh, an operator who's going to sink some real capital can, can spend you know, decades um, working there. And I think you know, this district has already exceeded that threshold. So if you, if you look from a 30,000 foot view, there's already uh, you know, five known deposits with resources, two, two known um, you know, drill confirmed targets that uh, don't have resources yet. So that would be Burgett in our case and Whiting Creek in, in Imperial's case. So uh, you've got a, you know, a belt or a, a trend certainly with um, seven known porphyries. Uh, the most recently discovered of these was, was SEAL lots of potential to, to make new discoveries. So I, I think, you know, this is arm waving for sure, but I don't think it's, um, you know, I'm not too far out over my skis to say with, uh, with some, you know, considerable success in testing a number of targets, if there's a, you know, potential to, to increase that by a, a multiple or a you know, decent percentage, you know, could this, could this district be in that, uh, you know, 2 billion plus ton range? I, I think so. And that would put it in, you know, rarefied space in Canada in terms of one of the biggest uh, porphyry districts in Canada. So I think that, that certainly matters for, you know, big mining companies looking at, um, uh, you know, copper copper districts to to really sink their teeth into, and then to your other point on you know production scale, I think you know 100,000 tons per annum uh, is is sort of a, a minimum threshold, and so when you're looking at these sorts of grades, that kind of leads you towards um, mill throughputs that have to be uh, you know certainly larger than what you see at uh, at Huckleberry today. So it's a 20,000 ton per day mill, and again, looking at some of the other operations in in BC, many of whom have been you know, aggressively focused on uh, throughput expansions in, in recent years. I, I think that um, 60,000 ton per day plus is sort of the, 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 um, the nice inflection point where you get to that critical scale from, um, you know, production-based perspective, but also, uh, you know, lots of you know, scale economy benefits from um, uh, a costing perspective. So, Again, can't point you to a, a study yet that Surge has put out that says this is the way we're going to deliver that. But I think in terms of the resource base today, the discovery potential, the infrastructure in place, it's um, it's not far off in terms of coming up with a, a concept that meets a lot of those, uh, those those scale thresholds. So we believe from a from an investor perspective, this is a project that or the, or, or a district that certainly should be on people's radars in terms of having that uh, significant scale potential that that should be. You know, relevant for uh, major mining companies uh, around the world. Understood. And this 2% NSR on the Blackwater project, what's the plan with this? Is are you guys looking to monetize this off to maybe a royalty company to help finance the core focus? Uh, what's yes. the plan with this NSR? Short answer is yes. Yep. It's it's non-core to us. It's um, obviously good, good timing given uh, what's going on with Blackwater, but um, it is in an area of that district which uh, sits off to the um, the east, so it was it was ground that uh, Surge and the, the predecessor name to Surge was was actively exploring. New, New Gold also put some some money into exploration in that area, so some interesting ge geology. But I mean, it's not a core royalty to the overall Blackwater project, but uh, but it is part of that uh, that overall kind of project map, and so uh, it, it's something that we would definitely uh, be looking to monetize. Uh, oh, yeah. Good to see that and good to see the option there to potentially uh, help finance and move that off the book. How about uh, maybe switching gears over here to local communities? What's your approach, Leaf, to dealing with local communities and how they will remain engaged with company efforts? Yeah, remain open, um, uh, stay in you know constant contact and you know positive engagement. And um, where we are based, there are you know multiple stakeholders in terms of indigenous nations in that area. And so, uh, you know, we, we need to remain equitable with uh, all of those groups and, and we do. And so it's a lot of, you know, keeping them informed of our, our activities, what we're doing, you know, as we get further down the track in terms of project design concepts, there's, there's obviously uh, deeper levels of engagement uh, required there in terms of understanding, you know, land, land use uh, details, but um, yeah, we're, we're sort of, constantly interested in providing employment and business opportunities uh, to, to those communities. So um, it's, it's an important part of this business and, and a you know, core focus of ours. How about overall strategy, Leaf? What do you see here in terms of just, you know, the bigger picture for the company? Do you envision that this is uh, 
some type of exit scenario for the company in terms of moving forward with expiration, um, success on the ground there, and then you know potentially selling the company to a major in the future. Uh, is there a operational desire there to build out and develop yourself in the future if should that come to economic reality? And then also with that, what do you think the time frame is for Surge? Anything you'd like to speak to on you know overall strategy? At a higher level, um, a big part of our thesis and strategy here is that you know copper in BC is is it's a niche area that is in, in our opinion destined to you know have more interest and and more focus for a lot of you know a lot of reasons just around tier one jurisdiction, but uh, but also importantly on the um, decarbonization side of things. So a lot of these projects in BC are close to infrastructure. You can connect to grid power that is already quite decarbonized and the energy intensity footprint of the operations themselves are quite attractive. And so in a, in a world where operators are, are interested in those things, uh, the, the BC districts, I think, are, are truly underappreciated today. Uh, there's also, you know, important discoveries that continue to be made that um, uh, I think are, you know, contributing to a paradigm shift in some of the sort of geological um, uh, stereotypes that that, that uh, these porphyry districts in, in BC have, some of the notable ones being, you know, the saddle discovery uh, from a, a few years back, obviously the Red Chris uh, deeps, things like that. So the, the, the potential for these porphyry systems in, in BC to deliver the goods, both in terms of uh, overall size as well as grade, is uh, uh, is I think a, a story that is not uh, done being written yet. Um, in terms of our particular strategy, look, I think in junior mining in general, the skill sets required and the and the kind of team sizes and manpower manpower required to transition from a exploration company to development to, to operations are are not something that you can kind of arm, arm wave around and gloss over. Those are big fundamental inflection points in, in a company. And the, the, there's no shortage of examples of, of companies uh, achieving great returns for their shareholders uh, by kind of sticking to, to one of those, those niches. So I think at any point in time, you need to be focused on gathering the right data, getting yourself in the right, uh, uh, you know, most informed position and always keeping an eye on where market conditions are, are, are pointing you towards and where the winds are blowing. Uh, to be able to step on or off different uh, different tracks. So I, I would never really put myself in a corner and say, uh, we want to do this for some particular reason. Like I think we're all pretty pragmatic about um, uh, all these aspects and we're primarily focused on uh, on creating value for all of our all of our stakeholders. Uh, where we are today as a, as a stage of company, it's it's very um, exploration and kind of project concept focused. We think we're going to make you know huge headway in those catalysts over the next uh, 12 months. Uh, but what differentiates us from a lot of other companies that could say the exact same thing is that there is infrastructure in this district that is currently not being used, and that provides a lot of optionality for where where this company uh, could end up or what what direction it could take. We're not at that we're not at that inflection point today, so I think it's premature to, to forecast to predict the future. But there's a lot of you know, option value that uh, accrues to us because of what exists there. And for potential investors who are on the sidelines listening, market cap of Surge stands at about 50 million Canadian. What would you say to them about considering the company for copper exposure at the current price levels? I think it's uh, an extremely compelling investment. People bandy about words like cheap all the time, but uh, it, it does feel that way. And there's lots of ways you can characterize that in terms of Reference to that 2016 PEA, you can look at um, you know enterprise value to resources. Um, lots of different approaches to value, but yeah, we're, our enterprise value today, net net of that uh, 10 million dollars in cash, is around 40 million. It's one of the biggest sort of copper resource inventories in one of the best areas of BC, being one of the best districts in the world. Tons of exploration, uh, you know, potential sitting ahead of us and um, you know, I think the important takeaway from that that historical study is that you know we're not necessarily trying to crystallize what was described in that, but it sort of points to the potential for a low capital path to production in this district should certain things come to fruition. But what what isn't really characterized or what isn't really known 
is what the sort of value uh, contribution of all these Berg, West Seal, et cetera. So if an investor is looking today and saying, you know, comparing our market cap to the, you know, the overall kind of value thesis described in that PEA, the important thing to know is, well, that doesn't that doesn't give any value to things like uh, West Seal or Berg. So at a minimum, you'd, you'd want to kind of add that or, or in some way combine that with a, I don't know, EV to resource or other other methodology to, to capture some of the value potential from, you know, the other 800 million tons of, of pretty high quality uh, porphyry resources we have in the district. So uh, I think it's screamingly cheap and in the context of what looks to be the best copper market, uh, certainly in my career, um, with, with a lot of legs to go forward, uh, it seems like an easy call to be made. And the best way for investors to reach out to the company? Info at surgecopper.com. Simple enough. I appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate the introduction as well. Good success in 2022 to you and take care. Likewise. Thanks a lot, Andrew.